Hello and greetings to everyone to Geography 1010. I've had the um, extreme pleasure of teaching this course uh, since 2006, uh, back where, where I am here uh, in the Allegheny Mountains of uh, Western Pennsylvania, currently at two area colleges. I also teach uh, world regional geography as well. Under the social science umbrella, I'd like to think of the study of geography as king. Uh, for those of you who are looking to go into education, uh, let me suggest to you that uh, having a working knowledge of geography and its five themes, which I'm going to elaborate on here in a moment, the five themes will provide a foundational knowledge of all the other social dis science disciplines, or in other words, um, if you know geography, uh, you have an inside track to teach you know, everything from history, cultures, to economics, right? So um, this is why I consider it as a discipline um, king uh, in the orbit of the, um, the, of the social sciences. Geography is uh, broken into two areas of study, human and physical geography. Uh, in regard to the five themes, you have location, place, uh, human environment, interaction, uh, movement, and regions. And there, these are ways to organize uh, instruction under the umbrella of geography. As for Christians, and I want to um, uh, weld uh, uh, much of the uh, this welcome message into uh, the Christian worldview and geography. Uh, as for Christians, we're commanded to be salt and light, spreading the gospel to the uh, the ends of the earth. So the study of geography plays uh, no insignificant role uh, within the study of the liberal arts. Let's take a look at the first theme here. Geography study begins at location. And... Um, yeah, I was thinking about this. We all have formative experiences at certain places. Personally, the uh, first 21 years of my life was formed at 4 Charles Avenue, uh, Egg Harbor City, New Jersey. And it's a town about uh, 15 uh, miles from the famed Atlantic City and, of course, the Atlantic Ocean. We have each been impacted by our anywhere USAs or wherevers, right? Forming the the grids of uh, our experience and how we uh, how we see the world. And ultimately how God uses us in his in his program. So the human and physical characteristics of location is place. And as I said, geographic study, funnels into uh, these two quadrants, human and physical characteristics. As for the physical characteristics, we are told in Romans 1.20 that uh, we can see God, right? We can see him in his invisible attributes, you know, the basic order of the world, right? Uh, could be the order of climate, plant and animal life, right, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, the passage goes on to talk about God's eternal power. Uh, and I was reminded of this. I am reminded of it uh, when I would go stand on the shore uh, looking out at the Atlantic Ocean, you know, nearby where I grew up. Uh, the sheer power of the sound of the surf, for instance, um, and the ocean waves, let alone the force uh, once I would plunge into that uh, that uh, first wave, and you had to be careful after you settled in uh, as to um, how far you strayed from the coast, right? And uh, so, I mean, it was environments like that. I just couldn't help but notice God, even before I became a Christian. And after I became a Christian, just the the power of it all. Uh, you know, luring me into worshiping God and my spirit. 
as to that awesome power. Then there's the Earth's divine splendor. That passage in Romans talks about, and again, the great scenes of the shoreline or where I am now in the midst of the, the uh, gorgeous Allegheny Mountains. The human characteristics of geography also give us a glimpse of God. And there I use the word diversity, right? But I will hear. I will hear. An over, very overused and um, word that uh, is used to maybe engage in polit uh, political uh, manipulation. But I'll use it here because we're not created robots. We're not created robots, but we have a free will to design the uh, cultural landscape of geographies. Second theme, place. So we see this in uh, perhaps landform use, right? Uh, forms of architecture, uh, the way people live, right? Ways of living, uh, their religious practices, political systems common diets, uh, local folklore, modes of travel, methods of communication, cultures so vast and different, but created in God's image to ultimately love and, uh, and worship him. I remember experiencing this at a missions congress in uh, 1989, to be exact, in Dusseldorf, Germany, on our way out of a week-long conference before embarking on missions campaigns across Europe and the various cities, there was a praise and worship service during the evening uh, down in a little valley area, um, top of the line, stagecraft set up, lights, you know. And um, I remember... You know, it's just held out outside of our compound. And I remember I stood on the hill and looked down at that uh, that concert, praise and worship concert, and I saw cultures around the globe uh, worshiping the Lord in song. And it was apparent, it was apparent that uh, there's probably no blood relationships as close as those folks of different cultures, languages, and skin color all meeting around the person of Jesus. Some of which, you know, politically and culturally were not supposed to be doing that, even acknowledging uh, one another, let alone having this camaraderie that they were experiencing in Jesus. As humans, we must interact with the environment too. And uh, this third term results in our shaping the landscape, right? So in Genesis 20, Genesis 1, 26 to, through 28, man has instructions on how to use the earth and, and what's in it. Uh, verse 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, right? And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So right there, you can see that God bestows a function for us and uh, to do so, right, with a, with a warm concern. God also turns full face to man as recipients in self-giving as well. Genesis 2, 15, the next chapter over, says, Then the Lord took man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep um and keep it right and keep it man had dominion as you know you just by hearing that verse or looking at it in at chapter 2 verse 15 man had dominion right and the forces of nature responded to man's uh beck and call even after the travail in the pre-human world and because of man's own disorder which we know about man still has power over nature and you could read about this in Psalm 8, verses 6 through 8, uh, James 3, 7, which I will quote here, for every species of beasts and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed 
and has been tamed by the human race. And in connection with this third theme of man's relation, human relation to the environment, the Bible also emphasizes the Lord's ownership of the earth as creator and sustainer. So the world would seem to mean the earth in all its fullest. Not for man's exploitation, but God's satisf satisfaction and, and glory. However, in entrusting man to oversee it, he's encouraged to enjoy it. Uh, some passages of scripture that bear this out, 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23, 1 Corinthians 10, 25, 26, and verse 31, right? Emphasize that, that we are to enjoy it. Under the umbrella of good stewardship, in enjoying it and of subduing uh, the earth, there is, um, you know, this command in Leviticus 25, 23, uh, uh, written to the nation of Israel under the law of Moses that, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, God says, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. So that entire section, that entire section, I think, bears application to us as well as it uh, yeah, kind of um, um, emblemizes the mind of God on this. Uh, the entire section explains property and possessions being returned to their original owners. Uh, this prevented one person or party from owning a majority of the land. Not that we're living in that type of system today, but that it preserves a balance. It preserved a balance of, in, in Israel at that time. And I think it that's the overarching concept I see here. It preserves a balance, uh, getting back to what I said a moment ago. And it involved then, it involved land planning and uh, maybe more um, uh, related to where where we need to be at today, uh, the application of some ecological principles, all right? We don't exploit it. Although, unfortunately, in Isaiah 5, 8 and Amos 2, 6, uh, we are told that that did not occur, right? Um, uh, in the nation of Israel. You know, and as, as the world becomes more and more globalized, access to movement, theme four, right? Theme four is becoming easier. With um, migration comes uh, the movement of ideas. And I was thinking about, um, you know, the recent war uh, with ISIS. And um, much of that took place in Syria. And, uh, you know, as a result, Syrians were emigrating uh, due to the war. But what is really neat about this is their opportunities to come in contact with Christian believers have been um, uh, uh, occurring more regularly. And uh, to the point where there's been a lot of Syrian, conver uh, Syrian uh, conversions. So... I say that to say that the gospel spreading, right? The gospel spreading with the expansion of things like uh, the internet too, right? The internet, uh, cell phone reception, um, and so much more around the planet. Um, governments that are very uh, oppressive um, really can't stop after this point what's going on in private homes via the internet. And uh, folks are getting saved, uh, again, exponentially in the Muslim world as, a, in, 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 uh, as an example. Uh, in India, um, you know, home groups by the thousands have been um, sprouting up due to the internet. Perhaps my favorite part of geographic study is that of the fifth and final theme, regions. A region is that which is delimited in, in some pattern. This could be something formal, such as a custom or something political, such as a, a boundary. Now, we call these formal regions. Now, these types of boundaries are, are common knowledge. Um, there are regions noted for what connects them to the wider world. 
geography geographers dub these uh, functional regions. Um, they're generally uh, economic hubs, which are often some kind of urban center. Uh, we create perceptions of regions or vernacular regions, third type of region, such as the Middle East, right? Um, Southeast Asia, the South, right? The mid the Midwest. And, and these are not formal boundaries, but they're kind of understood by uh, the mental maps that we create of the globe. Even in American society, uh, some of the regional differences are almost foreign when it comes to understanding one another's values. We see that at election time, right? With the red and blue maps and so forth. Let alone the disconnect uh, between someone who lives in Saigon and another in Lesotho. And all that brings us back to the sovereignty of God. And, and my thinking there goes right to Genesis 11 and I'm specifically verses one to nine in the Tower of Babel, right? Uh, as um, Theodore Hybert in his um, book, The uh, Tower of Babel and the Origins of World Cultures wrote, the tower has become a, a cultural icon he goes on, he says it symbolized the divine punishment against pride and arrogance with the tower with its top in the heavens. That's a quote from verse four in chapter 11. Thus the theme of the story, right? The human attempt to assert autonomy, uh, attack heaven, challenge God. So consequently, what came about was the divisions of languages and the dispersion of people. Hence, the origin of world cultures and the separation of major world regions. So as a result of God's displeasure with the building of the tower, penalizing human pride and restraining further attempts at it via language barriers, right? You get the picture. So aside from just enclosure to the theme, the fifth theme, aside from biblical scholarship, the Babel story, the Babel story has gained um, cultural legitimacy in John Milton's Paradise Lost and uh, the Dutch painter Peter Bruegel's work and uh, children's uh, story Bibles. So there you have it. Geography, a thoroughly wonderful and certainly relevant subject in uh, any liberal arts curriculum. Um, if you have any questions over the uh, next eight weeks or comments at any juncture, uh, please do not hesitate to uh, contact me. Uh, feel free also to contact me uh, by my office phone as well, which is uh, on the syllabus. Lastly, uh, do go over the syllabus and the discussion question rubric. The discussion question rubric is my, my rules there are a little different from the general. Uh, so you're going to want to read that. The game could be won or lost by what you know or uh, do not know uh, regarding those two documents. So have a great eight weeks. And you will if you uh, enjoy this uh, subject even at least half as much as I do, which I hope you do. Bye.